Hello everyone and welcome to another Cutrate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series in which we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cutrate standards. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at the Painbow Precon from Dominaria United and its face commander, Jared Cartholian, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see what Precon Upgrade from Dominaria United will be covering next. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the Commander and Game Plan. Jared Carthalian is a Planeswalker with 5 loyalty that can be our commander, costs Swooberg, and has the following abilities. His plus 1 creates a 3-3 Kavu token with Trample, that's all colors. His minus 3 gives up to 2 target creatures plus 1 plus 1 counters equal to the number of colors they have. And his minus 6 returns target multicolored card from our grave back to hand, drawing us a card and creating 2 treasures if that card is all 5 colors. Taking a closer look at his core stats, Jared is sporting a midweight and color intensive CMC, a respectable starting loyalty for his cost, and a set of abilities that are focused around creating, empowering, and recurring multicolored tokens and spells. His plus one is simple enough, creating a 3 3 trampler that he can use to screen attacks for himself as soon as he comes down, making it a dependable way to keep Jared alive initially and passively grow our board state turn after turn. Where this ability really shines, however, is when combined with his minus 3, turning up to two of these modest 3 3s into terrifying 8 8 tramplers thanks to them being all colors, making his first two abilities a deadly 1 2 punch that provides us with a steady stream of 8 8 trampling beat sticks. And of course, this isn't just limited to the tokens he creates, as any multicolored creature can benefit from this permanent stat increase, turning them into bigger and bigger threats the more colors they have in their color identity. And finally, his minus 6 serves as a source of recursion for our multicolored spells, which again fits with his multicolored game plan, but unlike his first two abilities, is a bit more lackluster. Sure, being able to recover spells is nice, and a draw and treasure creation is decent upside when hitting 5 color spells, but it costing a whopping 6 loyalty forces us to use it very sparingly, and its effect, especially when compared to other Planeswalker's alts, doesn't feel very impactful. Despite its downsides, however, it's still a decent enough source of recursion from the command zone with upside, which is always good to have access to in a pinch. So, as we can see, Jared is all about multicolored spells, with particular emphasis on multicolored creatures, aiming to get decent sized bodies on board with diverse color identities and then making them massive, which is why we'll be taking this precon upgrade exactly in that direction, loading up our creature base with plenty of 3, 4, and 5 color creatures that are solid enough on their own but absolutely busted when powered up by our commander. Luckily for us, the base build has already done quite a bit of the heavy lifting for us, including some very solid multicolored entrance for Jared to power up right out of the box, which we'll be expanding even further to ensure he has plenty of targets to choose from with decent keywords and abilities to make use of the increased stat blocks he provides. This then also extends to our multicolor payoffs, which again, the core build has a decent number of built in, but we'll be expanding on even further to ensure we get maximum benefit out of every multicolor spell we cast. And finally, because we'll be investing so heavily in multicolored spells, we'll need to ensure we have the ramp and land base to reliably cast them. The Precon already has a lot of staple rocks and ramp spells to help us out in this department, but we'll be refining it even further to guarantee we get access to all five colors we need as quickly as possible. And that goes double for our land base, which does already have a great selection of tri-lands and check lands, but we'll be improving on to make a bit faster while keeping its consistency with pain lands and slow lands. So let's sit back and watch the rightful heir of House Carthalian unleash the full might of all five colors of magic against those who dare threaten his home plane. He's by no means a stranger to defending the plane of Dominaria from would-be conquerors after all. Having defeated the insane planeswalker Rivadel to both keep it from falling under his rule and to avenge his father. And now, with the looming threat of New Phyrexia on the horizon, he joins the fray once more, standing with the mighty heroes of Dominaria against the remnants of Yogmoth's evil to banish it once and for all. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and playstyle, let's take a look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. 
Starting off with our kept creatures, let's first run down the multicolored entrance that made the cut. Beginning with our five color entrance, Maelstrom Archangel, Okagachi Vengeful Kami, and Two-Headed Hellkite all stay in due to being both evasive and possessing combat-focused abilities that allow us to cast free spells, remove permanents, and draw cards respectively as they swing in making them all perfect targets for our commander's counter distribution, permanently boosting them by an impressive plus five plus five to make them even more dangerous. Primeval Spawn then joins us as another five color entrant, giving us a 10-10 with impressive keywords if we're able to meet its hefty mana cost, which is made easier by our improved ramp and land base, and if we cheat it into play instead, at least gives us some free spells off the top of our deck as an alternative, which is a nice option to have if we can't hard cast it. Then Chromanticore and Fusion Elemental wrap up our five color holdovers. The former's decent stat block, impressive keyword suite, and ability to bestow itself on a target as an aura, making it a solid threat on its own or when combined with other creatures. And the latter being a base 8 8 for 5 that our commander can easily turn into a 13 13, making it far too big to ignore and becoming deadlier if we can grant it keywords. Either through means like the previous entry or others we'll be covering shortly. It's then on to our four color creature carryovers, with Glintine Nephilim being the only one that was included in the base build that also made the cut. Its low stats for its cost being offset significantly by Jared's ability to turn it into a 6-6, six -six, and its on damage draw allowing us to completely reload our hands if it gets in for damage after being pumped, which is again made easier by our evasion and trample granting sources. Speaking of which, as we make our way to our three color creatures that made the grade, we have the Mutate Pair, Eluna Apex of Wishes, and Nethroi Apex of Death, both of which have impressive stat blocks and keywords in their own right, but really shining when mutated onto other creatures to proc their free spells and recursion, along with granting the mutate target their keywords. And since mutate allows us to do so under the mutated creature, we can even keep the base creature's color identity if we're planning on growing them further with Jared, which is always a nice option to have. Sorok Dragon Claw also makes the grade in the three color category, his ability to make our creatures uncounterable and granting them AoE Trample making our board much more resilient and hard hitting, with the fact that he can do this at flash speed and being a beat stick himself just being icing on the cake. Rien Angel of Rebirth then wraps up our dry color keepers, providing all our multicolored creatures with a decent offensive stat boost and on death recursion that works even if she dies alongside them, making our multicolored threats that much harder to get rid of permanently. We'll then stay on the multicolor payoff plan as we move into our dual color carryovers, with Knight of Nualara and Faberro Elder both making it to the final build. The former being a multicolor lord that provides the same scaling growth as our commander to grow our creatures even further, and the latter growing as we get more different colored permanents into play, and more importantly, tapping to produce the mana for each color, making it a 5 5 that taps for Wooburg just with our commander in play for an insane amount of ramp. Jensen Carthalian Druid Exile also makes it into this category, both giving us decent card selection and fixing for our multicolored playstyle, and, once we start casting our five color spells, produces a steady stream of decent sized evasive bodies to grow our board state even further. And then we close out this lot with Baleful Strix, which makes the grade by being a very efficient creature that both deters attacks with its lethal combination of Death Touch and Flying, as well as Cantripping as it comes in, which is enough to earn it a spot in the final build. And finally, reaching the monocolored creatures that made it in, Falaji Wayfarer keeps its spot thanks to its ability to be considered five colors and effectively turning itself and all our creatures into mana dorks to help cast our multicolored spells, and Hero of Precinct 1 stays in by giving us a cheap and easy to proc source of token creation as we work our way up to our five color creatures. Moving on to our instant keepers, we start off with the removal spells Path to Exile, Terminate, and Beast Within all of which are keeping their slots by virtue of being excellent removal options that can efficiently deal with a variety of threats we may come across. Abzan Charm and Soltai Charm will then also be keeping their spots, thanks to the incredible flexibility they provide us with, all three of their modes being very usable in a wide variety of situations, ranging from removal, card advantage, card selection, graveyard hate, and even more. And then we have our last instance that made the grade, Unite the Coalition, which like the charms provides us with a wide variety of effects we can this time pick and choose to create a highly customizable effect, and at its worst is an instant speed draw 5 for 7 which isn't too bad. And while yes, its casting cost is steep, the ramp package we're running in this build should still allow us to reliably get there. Speaking of ramp, our sorcery holdovers bring us Farseek, Cultivate, Kodama's Reach, and Search for Tomorrow, all of which are very solid forms of land-based ramp that help us assemble our five-color mana base that much easier. 
Then moving on from Ramp to Wipes, Iridian Maelstrom, Merciless Eviction, and Doom Blast will all keep their spots to help us wipe the slate clean if it starts getting out of hand. Which will come in handy since we'll be dedicating a lot of the early game to ramping and fixing our colors. So we may need to clear the board to safely play our commander against more aggressive decks. And lastly, closing out our kept sorceries, we have Painful Truths, which in our build will almost always draw us three, making it a solid source of card advantage to keep our hands nice and full. It's then on to our enchantment holdovers, in which Mana Cannons and Maelstrom Nexus were the only two that kept their spots, the former turning all our multicolored spells into targetable damage that we can use as removal or extra reach, and the latter giving the first spell we cast per turn Cascade, getting us a free spell a turn for even more value, both working very well in our multicolored spell game plan. Artifact Keepers are then up next, with the category being comprised entirely of rocks, those being Arcane Signet, Felwar Stone, Obsidian Obelisk, and Coalition Relic, all of which are relatively cheap and can ramp for multiple colors to help take the edge off our color-intensive mana costs, with the added benefit of being colorless, making opening hands that lack green still playable if we open with them. And then finally reaching our last, but arguably most vital part of the build, the land base. We'll begin by keeping the entire Triland suite consisting of Arcane Sanctum, Crumbling Necropolis, Frontier Bivouac, Jungle Shrine, Mystic Monastery, Nomad Outpost, Opulent Palace, Sandsteep Citadel, Savage Lands, and Seaside Citadel, which may be slow but provide unparalleled access to the majority of our colors in a single package, making them well worth running despite their speed. The unofficial Triland Murmuring Bosk also stays in for this reason. The damage it deals us to give us access to two more colors being well worth the cost to up the build's consistency even further. The Checklands Canopy Vista, Cinder Glade, Prairie Stream, Smoldering Marsh, and Sunken Hollow will be keeping their spots as well, each only tapping for two of our colors but more than making up for it by coming into play untapped fairly easily and possessing basic land types to make them more easily fetchable, doing quite a bit to speed up this deck's otherwise glacial land base. Then quickly running down the remainder of our land carryovers, Command Tower and Exotic Orchard of course both stay in to provide us with easy access to both our own and our opponent's colors. Crystal Quarry and Cascading Cataracts keep their spots thanks to providing us with 5 color fixing if needed. Gross and Verge stays in as a form of non-basic land ramp to help smooth out our colors even further, while Evolving Wild and Terramorphic Expanse stay in to give us even more basic land tutoring. And finally, we'll be keeping the two plains, two islands, two swamps, two mountains, and three forests from the base build as our basics to round out our mana base. That leaves us with a final tally of 72 cards including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 28 cards to replace. So now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. Starting off with our very first upgrade to the build before we even touch the 99, we'll be adding in Jengatha the Wellspring as a companion. With our final build ending with no duplicate color pips on any of our cards, Jengatha slots in perfectly as our 101st card to give us a decent sized body and insane amount of ramp to help us cast our multicolored spells, which is always accessible to us at the start for only 3 mana, making it a viable alternative to spend our mana on in the early game if we find ourselves unable to ramp. Then moving on to our creature upgrades proper, we'll begin by tweaking our ramp creatures, replacing Solemn Simulacrum and Coiling Oracle, both of which are serviceable but are really meant to be flickered for maximum benefit, for Burnished Heart and Sakura Tribe Elder, which are cheaper and more reliable forms of ramp respectively to ensure we can get to the 5 colors we need more consistently. The legendary mana dork Zixara the Exemplary will also get the axe here, our lack of axe spells and being limited to producing two mana of the same color severely hampering its usefulness in this build, making room for Chulane Teller of Tales, whose creature focus draw and ramp fit better with our more creature focused playstyle, and whose ability to bounce our creatures can be situationally useful to protect them from removal and then proc himself and our other multicolor payoffs as we recast them. And then it's on to more multicolored creature additions as we move deeper into our creature upgrades. With Silvala Explorer returned and Zithris the Writhing Doom, both of whose abilities would find better use in group hug and wheel decks respectively, getting cut in favor of the five color legends Garth One-Eye and Horde of Notions. The former providing us with an insane amount of utility with the ramp, removal, and draw he provides, and the latter possessing an impressive suite of keywords alongside the ability to recur elementals, of which we're running a few, in addition to being able to be turned into 10-10 beatsticks thanks to our commander, making them significantly more useful than their predecessors. 
It's on to some new four-color creature entries then up next, with us axing our Chelagos Lagoon Mystic and Tiller Engine, who are both great at speeding up our mana base but felt a bit too redundant after modifying our rampant lands, as well as Transguild Courier, whose five-color identity sadly isn't enough to justify its vanilla 3-3 stat block, in favor of Dune Brood Nephilim, Witchamon Nephilim, and Your Tiller Nephilim, all of which are offense-oriented creatures with powerful abilities that suit our playstyle, and whose four-color identity allows our commander to shore up their biggest weakness of possessing middling stat blocks, permanently pumping them by plus four plus four to turn them into real threats. Atla Palani Nest Tender then also gets cut here, her ability being very useful to help us cheat hard to cast creatures into play, but being less good in our build since we have no reliable means of destroying the eggs she creates to do so. So we'll be replacing her with Yidris Maelstrom Wielder, who's better at cheating cards into play in this build thanks to his on-damage cascade, built-in trample, and again, four-color identity for Jared to pump up. Then reaching our new three-color creature entries, we'll be swapping out the Lackluster Wipes, Radiant Flames, Lava Lanch, and Time Wipe in favor of the Mutants, Brokos Apex of Forever, Vadrock Apex of Thunder, and Snapdax Apex of the Hunt, all of which are solid enough on their own thanks to their stat blocks and keywords, but really shining when mutated onto either Jared's Kavu tokens or other five-color creatures to grant them their keywords, making their improved stat blocks even more useful, with the latter two also proccing their mutate abilities to give us some additional recursion and removal. The unimpressive ramp spell Explore then loses its spot to the god Bane Lord of Darkness, who provides us with either draw or free spells as our creatures die off, and eventually turns into a hard to deal with threat himself as our life totals start to get low thanks to his indestructibility. Our single new dual color creature entrant is then up next, with the solid but somewhat unreliable ramp spell Growth Spiral losing its spot to General Ferris Rockrick whose ability to create 4-4s as we cast our multicolored spells, coupled with his protection against monocolored removal making him a surprisingly resilient multicolored payoff for our build. And finally, reaching our last new creature entrant, the super slow fetch Rock Tar Pit gets cut to make room for Scion of Draco, whose 12 CMC casting cost becomes more manageable thanks to its domain cost reduction and our land-based ramp, and its ability to grant an impressive array of keywords to all our multicolored creatures, turning our boards into nightmares for our opponents to combat against, especially if we mutate on top of it to give it a color identity so it can benefit from those keywords itself, with just hexproof making it almost impossible for our opponents to deal with it unless they wipe the board. Our new instants are then up next, with our only change being replacing the mediocre bounce spell Echoing Truth and the somewhat underpowered Naya Charm with the more impressive Broker's Charm and Riveter's Charm whose combination of flash speed removal, draw, and graveyard hate make them very flexible spells to have at our disposal for a variety of situations. Similarly, our sorcery slot won't see that many changes either, with explosive vegetation and migration path, both of which are spectacular ramp but a bit too slow for us, being replaced with rampant growth and nature's lore, each being much cheaper than their predecessors so we can cast them faster, and the latter even fetching up non-basic forests to give us access to dual lands for additional fixing, and the expensive removal spell Sylvan Reclamation being cut in favor of Conflux, whose massive CMC 8 casting cost is justified by allowing us to effectively tutor 5 cards from our deck directly into our hand, making it a great way to replenish our hands with exactly what we need in the late game. Proceeding to our enchantment upgrades, we'll be swapping out the fixing and cantrip Abundant Growth provides for Broker's Ascendancy, which helps us grow both our creatures and our commander turn after turn, and cutting Path of the World Tree to make room for the Kami War, which starts off as decent removal that eventually turns into a sizable five-color threat that also lets us recur resources from the bin, all the while making itself bigger as it does so to hit even harder. Then for our artifact upgrades, we'll be cutting Prophetic Prism and its OK fixing for Wayfarer's Bobble instead to give us access to another cheap source of land-based ramp to help fix our colors, and replacing the generic Commander Sphere with the more on-brand Tome of the Guild Pact instead, which serves as both an any-color rock and a repeatable source of card advantage as we cast our multicolored spells, making it a perfect include for the build. And finally, reaching our land base upgrades, we'll be swapping out the remaining slow fetches, Bad River, Flood Plain, Grasslands, and Mountain Valley, with the faster Painlands, Yavamaya Coast, and Lanawar Wastes, and the ironically faster Slowlands, Shipwreck Marsh, and Rockfall Vale, providing our land base with a decent increase to its speed without sacrificing consistency, ensuring we can usually get untapped access to all five colors by turn four or five when combined with our aggressive ramp package. So now that we've covered all 29 cards which we've upgraded or added to the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this precon upgrade. 
This deck currently has 33 creatures including our companion, 8 instants, 11 sorceries, 4 enchantments, 6 artifacts, 1 planeswalker including our commander, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have a total of 30 multicolored creatures, 10 of which are 5 colors, 5 of which are 4 colors, 10 of which are 3 colors, and 5 of which are 2 colors, 13 multicolored non-creature spells, 13 cards that care about multicolored spells, and 2 cards that care about 5 color spells. Giving us a large, multicolored creature base that can take maximum advantage of our commander's ability to grow them, in addition to a handful of non-creature multicolored spells and payoffs for them to generate us value as we cast them and our creatures. For general deck stats, we have 20 ramp sources, 11 card draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes. Our ramp being through the roof in order to ensure we can get access to all 5 of our colors as quickly and efficiently as possible, while our draw removal and wipes all fall within more typical numbers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 2 1 drops, 11 2 drops, 17 3 drops, 8 4 drops, 15 5 drops, 4 6 drops, 2 7 drops, 1 8 drop, 1 10 drop, and 1 12 drop, leaving us with an interesting looking curve that's mostly ramp in the early game, focusing heavily on getting us access to all our colors as quickly as possible so we can drop our commander, followed shortly after by our other multicolored creatures so we can pump them into the stratosphere. The final price then comes out to be $74.57 after upgrades. This price does not include tax and assumes that the price you paid for the pre-con was $40. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Child of Alara and Chromat both warrant consideration as powerful 5 color creature entries with big stat blocks and potent abilities, while Widespread Thieving, Bring to Light, and Legacy Weapon would all find a good home in this build thanks to the ramp, tutoring, and removal they provide that fit very well with our multicolored game plan. Then for further upgrades, improving the build's land base should be our top priority, with Triomes like Zingatha Triome, Indatha Triome, and Ketria Triome all being superb tri-lands we can tutor up thanks to possessing basic land types, and shock lands like Breeding Pool, Overgrown Tomb, and Stomping Ground again all providing us with great access to our colors, being easily fetchable, and even giving us the option to bring them into play untapped to speed up our mana base even further. From there, improved ramps such as Three Visits and Sky Shroud Claim would make great additions to tutor up our newly added lands. Luxor Gaudia's Gift is an interesting option that turns Jared into a creature so he can benefit from his own pump effect. Ramos Dragon Engine is a powerful multicolor payoff that keeps getting bigger as we cast our spells, which we can later use to ramp if needed. Chromatic Lantern, Dryad of the Elysian Grove, and Chromatic Orrery are all superb ways to fix our mana base, with the latter also being an excellent source of repeatable card advantage. And, if we don't mind cutting Jengoth as a companion, Iska God of the Tree and Progenitus make for superb additions. The former's backface, the Prismatic Bridge, being another superb way to cheat additional creatures into play, and the latter being a terrifying finisher that, while we may not be able to pump it, is still a massive evasive threat that's almost impossible for our opponents to interact with. And finally, for those with the deepest pockets, Atraxa Praetor's Voice is a fine addition to our build thanks to her combination of keywords, decent stats, repeatable proliferation, and four color identity. While the Ur Dragon makes for a powerful top end evasive beat stick that generates repeatable card advantage and free spells, each providing our build with some devastating firepower but at a steep price, ensuring that our wallets are left as hurt as our opponents. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. With Painbow covered, the next precon upgrade we'll be covering will be Legends Legacy and its face commander, Dehada Binder of Wills. So look forward to a Legends Matter build featuring her next week. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cutrate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.